food for thought. I love ADHD uh, kids and working with kids and teenagers. Some of my longest term patients and my own um, outpatient caseload are um, kids that I picked up when they were in preschool or kindergarten with ADHD who are now all in high school. One of the uh, biggest sources of joys that I've had as a child psychologist is getting to partner with pediatricians over the life course supporting kids and teenagers with ADHD. Um, in our uh, child psychiatry and child psychology training programs here, I've taught this course to um, both groups of our trainees. So I have, I've joked, I'm like, I could hold a filibuster <laughs> lecturing folks about PMTs. So I'll try to be um, as concise as possible. Um, the thing I think about PMT, uh, kind of echoing what Sarah said too, is that it's one of our most evidence-based psychotherapies in child mental health. Um, you don't have to have a disorder for a child to benefit from uh, increasing parents' uh, understanding of different behavioral strategies for supporting kids and increasing their positive pro-social adaptive behaviors while uh, avoiding inadvertently reinforcing or creating a coercive cycle between parents and kids. Um, probably the biggest uh, hurdle to um, getting successful engagement with PMT with a family is not pathologizing parents as they participate in parent training. So, um, you know, there's probably in different like subcultures of, uh, you know, modern society, like people who have dogs as pets and go and take their dogs to obedience school appreciate that, you know, there's nothing intuitive necessarily about raising a good dog, a non biting dog, a cooperative dog. Um, but somehow we have a very different um, presumption about child rearing. And one of the fastest ways to see um, uh, judgmentalism in our modern society is to watch children misbehave and then see what uh, the peanut gallery has to say about the parent's role in the child's misbehavior. Um, I would definitely say for parents of kids who have ADHD and disruptive behaviors, that's especially true. Um, especially true. So a lot of compassion goes a long way when we're trying to sell parents on the idea that targeting their behavior to, to benefit their child without uh, stigmatizing or pathologizing what we know to be the neurodevelopmental neurobiological basis of ADHD. I think having both of those components is like, yeah, kind of like with autism, everyone knows that this is a, a brain based disorder and nobody in modern times compared to ancient times thinks it is a parent's fault for a child having autism. We're still working on that in ADHD. So. The old, um, you know, from the 1800s, 1900s conceptualizations of ADHD as a, a disorder of moral deficit is still present implicitly in many people's minds. Like, this is a person who's deciding not to do things that they should be doing versus we know that it's a disorder of dysregulated self-control across emotions, behavior, and cognition. And so being able to teach parents that they're really in like a super class, almost like elite athletes. That if you're going to be to the top of your game, uh, you really need to have some high level training, just like someone that's going to the Olympics. And that's literally the metaphor I use. It's that other parents do not know what it's like to be parenting the Energizer Bunny at 10 o'clock at night. So we are going to learn a lot of strategies to parent a very uh, highly rewarding, exuberant, highly challenging little person. Um, so the there's no question. I, I had a, an unsuspecting, very sweet first year child psychiatry uh, fellow in our program here. He was like, is there an evidence space for parent management training? And I said, oh, yes, <laughs> there is a wide and deep base for the um, evidence base of parent management training. Um, the base is uh, especially uh, effective for younger kids and school age kids. Um, I've treated teenagers that have like severe ODD and maybe even like blossoming conduct disorder. It can still be helpful, but the effect size is sort of inversely proportional to age. So we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck preschoolers up through school age kids. Once you get to like, you know, the slide has 13 years, like the teenage years. The problem is not that it can't be effective, but that the child by virtue of age and developmental status now has so many other social contexts beyond the parent child interaction that it's very difficult to control all the other environments to drink to gain primary control over the child's behavior. Um, so if you had a teenager, for example, that you're like, oh, well, couldn't this work for them? But they're also like, you know, running around, staying out late at night. They're doing these other kind of like illegal behaviors. 
that's where we would kind of transition folks into multi systemic therapy, which is based on parent management training and social learning principles, but then extends it out across all the different social environments that children find themselves in. It's a little hard to access MST. It's also hard to access PMT. And the crazy thing is, is that it was developed by a psychologist in the 60s. How many years later is it now? And there's still, it's, we're, we have a hard time finding a lot of resources for um, clinicians who take insurance who also uh, are experts in parent management training. Um, so the there's many different programs and, you know, depending on like mental health training, you know, for those of us in primary care settings too, you may have gotten exposed to different books, um, different kinds of training programs. Um, our ACAP guidelines around kind of like the essential ingredients of effective parent management training strategies really look at these kinds of um, principles and those are found across all different sorts of parent training programs. So. Um, we have the Chicago Parent Program, the Incredible Years, Helping the Non-Compliant Child, Parenting the Strong-Willed Child. All of these kind of form on the basis of social learning theory. Um, one of the most uh, po impactful of which is built using positive reinforcement to build a positive, um, adaptive parent-child relationship. Um, these other things kind of, kind of flow downhill from that. So trying to change the balance of a parent's attention as they're interacting with their child. And trying to have, um, maybe you guys are aware of this, like five to one positive to negative ratio of attention that we see in all sorts of human relationships. Scottman, for example, popularized this in like the romantic relationship end of the you know family lifespan continuum. But especially when interacting with um, kids who are hyperactive, impulsive, disruptive, it's very difficult to get a ratio of five positives for every one negative, particularly when you're having to correct so many things. Um, and so you'll get to see, like, how do we take some of the typical anticipatory guidance things that I'm sure pops up in everybody's up to date around different kind of developmental stages and how that's really related to this broader specialized treatment. Um, there's different ways to deliver these treatments. So the slide is showing like group based therapies versus individual therapies. Um, there's some suggestions that for um, uh, families that may have less. Um, interest or orientation towards psychotherapy as a mode of intervention may do better in a group-based setting so that they can hear from other people's experiences as they're trying out the treatment. So the like Chicago Parent Program as an example. Um, but depending on the intensity of the child's behavior problems or how long they've been present, having a one-on-one -on -one kind of like traditional outpatient therapy setting might be the most effective. Um, so one of the theories for parent management training is that parents inadvertently reinforce undesired behaviors in their children. So what does that look like? We're at the Target, I'm at the grocery store, my, we're in the line. It used to be the example I would give was candy. Now we actually actively have a whole row of toys that surprisingly are only at reach if you're like three feet tall or shorter. And my son is like, oh, look at all these pack of the Ninjago cards, the Pokemon, the blah, 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 blah. And then you end up like this little boy falling out on the floor and it's like, okay, I don't want my kid to cause a scene. I'm feeling embarrassed. God forbid anybody knows I'm a psychologist standing in the store and recognizes me. How do I handle this? And so oftentimes what we see, particularly with kids with ADHD and disruptive behaviors, is that they're more prone maybe to escalating more quickly. And on the parenting side, it's like, oh, I want to tamp that down as quickly as possible. If I give them the thing, it sort of ends that negative interaction but what has it done for the um, child's learning process? They may not be able to verbalize it, you know, when they're two and a half or four, like this little boy, but as they uh, grow over time, I know how to get what I want. If I have a tantrum, my parent gives me what I want. They don't know that it's because the parent's embarrassed and that the child's behavior is functioning as a punishment using behavioral terms, but that is what's happening over time. Um, the fun thing to me is that when I'm teaching parents about Kind of like these basic behavioral principle of principles of reinforcement and punishment. So reinforcement not being like a prize, but something that increases the likelihood of a behavior over time and punishment being something that decreases the likelihood of a behavior over time. Then they can start to see the functional consequences of just natural responses to another human and go, oh, actually, I do not want to reward my child for giving a tantrum in the grocery store. I'd actually like to withdraw my attention which actually is the punishment 
not paying attention to that and then watch that behavior drop. It's like, oh, well, I have to like endure a little bit of distress and potentially like the negative, you know, looks and comments of others. But I know that that's functionally what I need to do in this situation to actually decrease the behavior. Um, children inadvertently reinforce undesired uh, behaviors in their parents. Um, I, there's a whole lecture we could kind of get into about the coercive cycle, and there's like a really nice diagram if folks are interested in seeing this. But basically, um, when kids are not cooperating with parents' commands, so let's say a child that may be sort of on the way to being something labeled as non compliant or oppositional. Um, Parents, adults, I mean, even other children will do this. I'll watch my son and daughter do this. Like my son will ask my daughter a question when she's absorbed in something else. And then he's sort of repeating the question. The same thing happens to us as adults. who are trying to get kids to do something they don't want to do. We naturally go to, well, I've already told you what to do. I'm going to say it again. And sometimes we'll even comment. How many times do I have to tell you as if the universe will provide an answer? 17, Carissa, ask it 17 and then they will answer. So when kids don't respond immediately, and then we escalate and make a threat, and then they respond, they basically have taught us that they're going to ignore us until we've escalated because that's when we actually start reinforcing or you know enforcing compliance. Um, so you can see the joke I used to make with uh, parents in my practice is that um, kids are having little secret society meetings and they're teaching each other about how to escape the um, tyranny of parental demands. And one of the ways to do it is just to not comply the first time that a parent asks and to only comply when the parent is at Mach 17 of like my head is exploding on fire. They're like, okay, I'll do it now. It's like, why do I have to get this angry? And I would say we don't, but that's a natural reaction to um, a child who's inattentive and slow to respond because of other reasons. And so I think, one of the things that I'm thinking about too as a um, clinician is that when I'm working with a family of a child who has ADHD, it's really helping them understand the nature of ADHD and how those symptoms manifest across the developmental lifespan. So a, a child who was diagnosed with ADHD, let's say in second grade, and now we're in middle school, the manifestation is gonna look a little bit different, but the fundamental disorder is the same and the principles of uh, deficient self-regulation are still there. So, for example, I have a couple of boys that I started working with when they were in elementary school. They're now both in high school. They tower over me. They're so cute. You know, they're in that string bean stage and I'm like, oh, I'm like looking up to a ninth grader, right? Um, they're now showing more of the emotional self-regulation problems as teenagers with ADHD and helping them understand how these different manifestations happen over time gives the family more uh, knowledge Okay, so when this is happening, like I understand that this is part of what you know we're still growing with as a family, right? And so that helps us be able to engage parents to use some of these strategies more effectively across time. So a big thing that we're trying to do is help parents clarify which behaviors they like, and we want our children to see, and then make a plan for consistently reinforcing those behaviors. Um, so oftentimes, you know, I'm dealing with a little energizer bunny. Um, when they're not doing something inappropriate, phew, I just got to get over here and take a break. Cause I've been working so hard to deal with all the behaviors I didn't like now that they're doing something. Okay. I'm just going to take a break. And that's exactly where we need to turn up the juice and say like, oh my gosh, I really like how cooperative you're being. I really like how you put your book bag away. I really like that you put your paper up. Thinking about how many times we have to correct things like, please don't spread your stuff out all over the couch. Please don't put one shoe here and one shoe there. Please don't leave this out. Please put this up. All of the commands that we give, um, there's been um, some studies that have looked at the rate of commands, not only with kids with um, ADHD or ODD, but um, just kids at different age groups. And so depending on the age group setting, we may see as many as, I don't know, five commands a minute. So if I was sitting or even more frequently, this would be kind of fun for everybody to go home and do if you still have school age kids. It's like, just have one parent or somebody in the family observe someone else. I do this with our residents when we have like a little practice of learning how to do one on one special time or play time to see naturally how directive we are as adults towards kids. So now I'm trying to change that rate of uh, parental attention instead of like telling somebody what to do, kind of shifting it into praising what I want to see more of. Um, 
when we do that, it kind of gives us a different slant on how we can shape behavior and also start to be more aware of how we may be inadvertently giving more attention to the exact things that we don't want to do or, you know, the behaviors that we don't want to see. Um, obviously, every family has its own culture. Different cultural groups may have different child rearing practices or accepted beliefs about children's behavior or the role that parents have in uh, changing children's behavior. So it's important to tailor the recommendations that we're making related to each family's preferences and beliefs. Um, I don't know that there's going to be any culture that doesn't value um, trying to raise, you know, a kind, uh, respectful young person, citizen, you know, neighbor, um, brother, sister. Um, I think another thing too is that most parents would readily identify that they want their child to have a positive attachment to them. And so being able to couch the, the delivery of these different skills in a way that feels personally relevant, personally meaningful for the parents is really important to kind of keep buy-in and motivation. Um, so on our um, positive uh, preventative side of things in parent management training, uh, we have four strategies listed here. So the first is the child-centered time, one-on-one -on -one time, special time, depending on which program, um, establishing routines, using positive attention or praise, and then reward programs. Um, within the child-centered time, often what is prescribed is like 15 to 20 minutes of one-on-one -on -one time, kind of um, unstructured play to give parents an opportunity to practice what we call our attending skills, which is just paying attention to positive or neutral activities that the child is doing so that we can practice using our um, kind of praising and reinforcing behavioral strategies. Um, research would suggest that even if we go down to even like to five minutes a day, but consistently practice it, it doesn't have to be like a, here we go, kind of like, oh, I injured myself and now I gotta go do my PT. I don't wanna do it. I think I'm just not gonna do it. It's too much work and I wanna do it. Making something and I'll say to parents, like even just like putting a little timer on your phone so that when it dings, you know that you can, you know, go run, do the laundry, the dishes, make dinner, whatever, um, so that they can try to have uninterrupted uh, kind of like focus on the child. Um, on the routines thing, especially thinking about this from a COVID perspective, COVID, virtual schooling, you know, things being kind of like um, out of whack for so many months and now trying to get back into a regular routine. The disruption to routines, we think, was one of the biggest uh, reasons why kids were having so many emotional and behavioral worsening. Um, and definitely for kids with ADHD, when I see kids and parents during structured times, like in the first few months of school, compared to like school breaks, holidays, whether it's just that, you know, couple of weeks around the winter holidays, a couple of weeks around spring break or the summertime, and how that correlates so quickly with behavioral worsening. Um, I have seen so many families where we had achieved really great like uh, routines and parent um, influence and uh, management of kids' behaviors. And then all of those routines, we're on vacation. Like we get up at random times, we go to sleep at random times, we have uh, uh, unfettered access to the internet or my phone or video games or whatever. And then when they start to implement just a little bit, instead of kind of like keeping the routines consistent, how quickly we can get kind of kicked back from the kids and coming back to me like after the winter break and they're like, everything was so good. And then on vacation, it was horrible. And I was like, okay, well tell me about X, Y, and Z basic routine. They're like, oh yeah, right. No, we weren't doing any of that. Cool. Okay. So we did a little experiment. We did like an ABA design. So we had a treatment, we took it away and now we're putting it back in. Let's just see what happens. Oh, cool. Everything went back to normal. So maybe we could see next time, like, not that we have to be like super regimented, like, a control freak, but like, see how much we can loosen up without losing the um, regulatory aspects of a routine for kids with ADHD. Um, on the topic of praise, um, think about this even from like a staff morale uh, standpoint too, as much as a parent management of kids. So praise appears to be the most effective when we can make it more specific and concrete and explicit. So instead of like, you know, my wild flower child exuberant bouncing all over the place. And I say, good job with school. I say, I really like how well you sat down and focused on your homework. I'm really impressed that you finished those difficult math problems. I am so amazed that you've already put your stuff in your reading log. You did such a great job doing all these hard homeworks or whatever. Trying to get very specific because kids are then hearing like the things that I want to see. 
right? And trying to help them see that I'm focused as much on those positive things and hopefully my five to one balance. I'm focusing as much or more on those things as I am about all the things that I have to correct. Right? Like where the shoes are, where the clothes are. Did you brush your teeth? Did you brush your hair? Did you do this? Did you do that? All those parent commands that we have to do. Finally, probably um, everyone's least favorite thing that when we're doing PMT that, you know, it's difficult for me to our reward programs. Um, I think about this uh, from like a um, financial economist standpoint for families. It's like, I don't want to have to help anyone set up a reward system any more than parents want to implement a reward system, but it is there as a highly effective strategy if we use all these other positive preventative parenting strategies. And if they get things going in the right direction, but they're not quite bringing it home, then we can use a token economy or a reward system to try to help systematize how we're managing kids' access to certain things. So we'll kind of get into that in a, a few more slides around kind of contingency management. Um, let's see. Let me skip through a little bit. The descriptive commenting, um, the child-centered time, the one-on-one -on -one time, the big... Uh, activity that parents are doing during those interactions is really almost like a sports commentator describing what's happening in the moment and really trying to hold back from telling kids what to do or asking a bunch of questions. The reason for that is that it keeps the focus on the child, kind of lets the child see that they are the center of our attention during, you know, as a working parent, I have to say, I often am not able to give my children undivided attention for long periods of time, right? Like, oh, I'm helping with the homework and I'm making dinner. I'm helping, you know, get them ready for bed while I'm also like, you know, starting the laundry, starting the dishes, doing my own homework from work, right? And so even being able to spend five or 10 minutes of undirected attention, what I like to say to parents is that it's giving kids super concentrated doses of us to build our relationship the way you would when you're dating someone or you're getting to know a student or a trainee is that you have to invest in the relationship so that the person is willing to then be with you during tough interactions where you're gonna have to give some corrective feedback or set a limit. And so we're sort of like, I'm gonna pick on my Gottman, uh, you know, metaphors again, it's like points in the love bank. The more we do this one-on-one -on -one time with kids, it's like I'm putting some emotional points in that love bank for the child so that when they lose stuff or they didn't brush their teeth because they forgot or whatever else, they know that there's a deep well of love because of all of that positive one-on-one -on -one time that we gave them where there was, it was not marred by any corrections or uh, uh, commands. Um, regarding routine, so thinking about like an ounce of prevention, it's worth the pound of cure. I love to do this from kind of like a task analysis standpoint. If something is going well, then I don't need to come in and like tell parents how to do it better. I really only, only want to help change the routines if they're not working well. So if they're like, oh my God, we're, I've been late to work and my supervisor is cussing me out because my kid was doing X, Y, and Z in the morning. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, that is super frustrating. Is there anything in those morning uh, activities that we could try to move to the afternoon or the evening to lessen up the pressure on you kind of managing this person who maybe is slightly disheveled in the morning, right? Like what, how can we make this a little bit more easy to manage? And then if we need to, can we pair that with access to a preferred activity either in the afternoon, evening, or the morning to try to gain compliance before I go to like a big token economy, right? So um, maybe the child has a hard time getting dressed and they're like, oh, they were up there laying in the bed and they weren't doing anything. I'm like, okay, well, is there any re rewards or any fun thing that we could give them in the morning, like after they get dressed and they could go do X for a few minutes? Maybe I don't normally want somebody to have iPad time or TV, but I could like let them watch two minutes of something if they come down and they're ready to go because giving them that two minutes was gonna make a 30 minute task or you know a five minute task that stretches out into 30, stay at five minutes. So something that's a little bit doseable. Um, the positive things for parents is that they're now having influence over the child during, I would say like one of the heights of um, Child misbehavior causing parents stress times is I'm racing the clock to get the child to school, to get parents to work or whatever they need to do afterwards. So if we can manage a morning routine that feels unharried, <laughs> unhurried, um, smooth flowing, kids feel good, parents feel good, and that can often set the tone for the whole day, dropping off our little learners at school. 
that they're fresh and ready to learn and they're not been stressed out by like not cooperating or having a hard time getting ready. Um, the other thing I would say too about routines is that when parents have a child with inattention or disruptive behavior, that if we don't have a routine, the parents have the decision fatigue moment to moment of how am I going to manage this behavior, that behavior, this non cooperation. And so if we have a routine, then it helps us to establish predictability that can reduce stress for kids. Um, as Sarah was mentioning, the comorbidities of kids with ADHD by the time they're teenagers, uh, they have an odds ratio of three times the rates of depression, suicidal thoughts, suicide attempts compared to kids without ADHD. And so us helping families establish effective ways of managing day-to-day -day hassles probably will contribute long-term to mitigating their risk for depression and other stress-based disorders as they get older. Um, I talked a little bit about praise. Um, the more specific, the better. Obviously, when a, a compliment from a loved one is genuine, it feels very different than a sarcastic uh, backhanded com uh, comment from somebody that's trying to make you feel bad. Um, some families can be resistant to praising a child before their behavior has fully turned around in a more um, manageable way. And so at times I've had uh, parents, um, it's hard for me to like sum it down without going into a whole bunch of background, but suffice it to say that it's difficult to uh, enjoy being with a child who's difficult to manage all the time. And parents can end up feeling like, well, I know I, I do, I love this person, this is my child, I love them very much, but I really don't like being with them most of the time and I feel guilty about the lack of warmth that I'm feeling towards this person that I know I verbalize loving. Um, and so when families are in that uh, period of like, I'm kind of burned out, like my the parenting well is dry because I've had to do so much for this person that is so challenging. Um, it can be difficult to like start the praise uh, fountain from flowing, but helping parents, sometimes what I'll do in session is like, I take on the parent praising role so that I say what I think the parent could be appreciative of, just to kind of prime the pump a little bit. Like, I think your mom is really proud of you for being able to sit at the table and talk to us about this thing. Like, I know she's really impressed how hard you're working for us to work on X, Y, and Z. So that they're still hopefully like the parent love bank is starting with me kind of like reflecting something that then the parents can be like, oh, okay, well, actually, I do like that. I wouldn't have ever praised that, but okay, yeah, actually, I can't disagree with that. Yeah, I do like that. Thank you for sitting there. So sometimes like doing it in that roundabout way can be non judgmental of the parent, like, well, you should be doing this, even though I know you don't want to, and kind of like helping model for them in a non judgmental way. Um, reward systems. So um, I don't know about you guys, but I don't really care for uh, stickers. I wouldn't work for Skittles. I would work for Hershey Kisses and Reese's Cups, right? Um, I would not work for Monopoly money or a Bitcoin, but if uh, money was going to come in my direct deposit, I would work for that. I mention all this to say like different kids have different things that motivate them. And when we're doing token economies or reward systems, we have to know what the currency is that's going to motivate the child in front of us. And so parents could try to start something like a sticker chart and they're like, oh, but my kid is not really responding. I guess they don't respond to rewards. And I would say, no, I think your currency is just for a different society. Your child must be in a different currency society. We need to find the currency that's going to work for them. Um, I remember when uh, my daughter is 11 now, but when she was probably around like nine months, I'm trying to remember the ages and stages questionnaire when it's like a looking problem solving behavior where you're supposed to put like a Cheerio in like a little uh, vial and then see like, do they shake the thing upside down right to get out the Cheerio? My daughter could not have cared less about a Cheerio. I gave it to her and she's going, yeah, whatever. I walked away. I was like, huh, I wonder what she would do if I put like an M&M in there. And then she was like, ah, I get this M&M, right? So it's like, we want to find something that's not just regulating, you know, like from a, a motivational standpoint, but incentivizing. Um, and so making sure that we create a currency that is incentivizing enough that it kind of moves kids towards wanting to change a behavior or cooperate with a routine or a structure that parents are trying to implement. 
Um, the joke I like to say to parents too is I'm not saying that we want to have a sticker chart in place for when they go to college, but if we need to do that, then we can kind of change it and uh, kind of organically fade it or shape it over time, depending on what this child needs. And it's amazing to me. You know, I mentioned I've had these kids for 10 years now, kids in high school that I met when they were in kindergarten. How effective having this like preventative strategy from the routine standpoint, coupled with a contingency management of access to reinforcers, how effective it can be, especially when the child has been used to this over the course of their lives. It's just something that we do. It's amazing. Okay, so effective limit setting. Um, our words are powerful. We want to choose them wisely. We don't want to waste them. Uh, in a parent management uh, kind of overview, um, I often think of the child psychologist who has dedicated his entire life to um, supporting uh, people of different ages with ADHD. His name is Russell Barkley. I'm sure everybody's probably seen a video or heard of you know his books or his website, his ADHD newsletter. Um, one of the big things that he talks about is act, don't yak. And I try to keep that in my mind too. It's like an economy of words with a person with a limited attention for the things that I want to get them to do that they don't like to do is very critical, right? So I want to have a, a clear command. I don't want to give excessive commands. The more commands I give, the fewer commands are going to be followed. So sometimes this is a little mathematical trick. If I ask a parent, like, well, what's your, your estimate for the frequency of your child's compliance with a first command given? And they say 50%. I'm like, okay. So the best way for us to get them to 100% then is to reduce the total number because we have like a rate now of how often they're going to uh, comply with the command. So if I reduce the commands, it's going to make it easier for me to get compliance and then reinforce compliance every time a kid cooperates with something. Um, so our, um, you know, our old ADHD uh, kind of uh, adage of I want to take a big, long, complicated thing and I want to break it down into smaller bits to help kids kind of get through faster. If I break down commands the same way and then I provide reinforcement after each one, Hopefully it actually makes kids more receptive instead of resistant and stubborn against receiving a command. Kids with ADHD and disruptive behaviors naturally elicit a lot of commands, more commands than other kids are getting. And so we wanna make sure that when we're giving them more, that they're also getting more from us because it's taking so much work for them to manage the executive dysfunction that they're coping with every day. Um, Ignoring behaviors that we can, because I can't correct everything. And if it's something that we can't ignore, then letting something be so it doesn't create, you know, um, resentment or negative feelings, and then trying to strategically use distraction. Um, let's see. So good commands are brief, they're clear, and they don't communicate um, optional <laughs> responding. It's clear that it's a command. It's not a request, a favor, or a question. Um, it helps establish the expectation. It keeps things uh, understandable for the child. Let's see, I'm gonna kind of get through a little bit more of this. Um, you can see with these commands, they're short. They tell the child what to do. I think that's a, an important thing too, is that we're trying to tell kids what to do, not necessarily just telling them what not to do. Um, sometimes, it, people can feel uncomfortable with having direct commands and, you know, like, oh, well, be nice with your sister or are you being nice to the cat? It's like giving a very direct, behaviorally explicit, operationalized command can be really helpful because it can tell kids what they're supposed to do. Like, what is nice? What is don't be mean? You want to be very explicit. Like, I want you to keep your hands to yourself. Literally, sometimes I'll tell my son, like, I want you to put your hands in your pockets now instead of stop touching all the toys in the target aisle. Jude, it's time for you to put your hands in your pockets. And he, know, he knows we have a whole drill, but sometimes just telling kids what to do, and then I can praise them for that instead of getting on to them for not following that negative command. Um, so we have a couple of uh, logical consequences and contingency managements here. So we have if then and when then. So if then we're using, um, like if you do something, I, you know, I, against the rules. If you engage in a rule violation, then this is the consequence that's going to happen. Um, we could pair that, for example, with timeout or loss of access to a preferred activity like playing with a toy or getting on an iPad, something like that. Um, for when then, it's telling them 
uh, behavior that we want them to do, right? So when you put your shoes on, then you can come sit on the couch and watch TV with your sister. When you put your um, dinner plates away, then I'll let you come over and have a little treat, something like that. Um, in both cases, it's establishing the expectation and what the consequence is going to be. So again, thinking about that predictability breeds uh, positivity, peacefulness, cooperation. It lays things out in a very clear way, particularly when us as parents kind of continue to establish that. Um, ignoring does not mean I have uh, relinquished my parental responsibilities or that I don't care about good behavior and bad behavior. It means that I understand that there are times to pay attention to increase positive behavior, and there's times that attention worsens negative behavior. And so I want to be a discerning parent that can tell the difference. Um, so if a child is doing annoying behaviors, whining, you know, nagging, uh, repeated questioning, when are we going to be done? When are we going to be done? When are we going to do this? When are we going to do that? Responding every single time is actually just increasing that attention seeking behavior versus ignoring it and having the child learn. I'm not going to respond to repeated requests. Um, I don't know how much this comes up for you guys at primary care. It doesn't, I feel like it doesn't come up as much for me now in outpatient uh, sessions as it did once upon a time. So I don't know if this is something that's shifting more broadly or if people don't like to talk about these things, but um, I can remember being in graduate school and my um, professor being very upset that we didn't want to correct a parent talking about spanking. Um, and I think it's helpful to understand, like, when parents are using physical discipline, how they're using it, when they're using it, without jumping to conclusions as much as we can, but also being mindful that child abuse is a real problem and we don't want to miss an opportunity to be sensitive to intervening. But the thing that I think about is that most people do not want to use spanking as their first management strategy. That usually comes out of, I've tried other things and now I'm getting frustrated and kind of reaching the end of my armamentarium of uh, clever ways of managing kid behavior. And so I like to focus more on if there's certain behaviors that seem to elicit that reaction from parents, I want to get ahead of that from a prevention standpoint to create something that's more positive that eliminates the need to engage in that behavior. And so that's what I would even say to parents is like, Obviously, everybody gets to choose what they feel like is in a child's best interest. And I want to make sure that I'm giving you every possible strategy that I can think of that makes you feel comfortable and peaceful in managing your child's behavior. Um, I don't know if it's going to be super helpful for me to read all of these, but these are the four themes of effective strategies that kind of unite the different parent managing uh, platforms. There's all sorts of websites that you could go to for different parent, parent management strategy trainings. Um, the list that we have here um, was taken from the Chicago Parent Program, um, which was developed by one of our um, nursing colleagues here at Hopkins when she was still um, at the University of Chicago. So regardless of the discipline strategy that a parent uses, ideally the strategy would be tied to a specific behavior uh, be safe and appropriate for the child's age, be predictable, be controlled, as in not impulsive or, and number five, driven by some emotional process, which would then make it a little bit less predictable, um, be done uh, with compassion for the child, demonstrating kindness as much as we can, end on a positive note when possible, and make it clear to the child that it's not um, uh, causing disruptions to the parent-child relationship. Uh, so some final points, we're trying to help parents um, know and be recognized as the experts of caring for their own children. We're trying to gear it as much as possible to what their concerns are, regardless of what my perceptions may be of what's happening. And then trying to kind of like find an intersection between those so that we can kind of get the change that they want, either from their parenting style, from their child's uh, behavior, or from the parent-child relationship itself. Um, it is definitely possible for us to give parents a range of options and we want to make sure that they're feasible as well as effective. So I don't want to give someone something that's just easy, but doesn't really do very much. By the same token, I don't want to give them like an overly complicated point system that they're never going to use. So we need to kind of have that balance between what's going to work and what's going to be practical, pragmatic. 
Um, I often say to parents, like, you know, I know a whole bunch of parenting strategies and I know that different kids respond differently to certain things. And so I'm happy to make sure we're individualizing this to you and your child as much as possible. Um, there may be some counterindications for families that will be ready to optimally engage in these like behavioral modification strategies. And so it may be that, you know, a mom who has not quite gotten over the hump of postpartum depression or, you know, parents who are divorcing or going through other kind of challenging life circumstances may need to have the support of another clinician to stabilize those things. At the same token, it may be that stabilizing things in the parent child relationship could help with some of these things. Um, there are many life circumstances that make parenting in a consistent way challenging, and yet time after time, study after study, like divorce is a perfect example that engaging in parent management training actually promotes positive child adjustment through a range of different um, life circumstances. Uh, parent management training is one of the identified effective treatments for um, families who have a child who's experienced a traumatic event. So if you go to the National Traumatic Child Stress Network, you'll see that PCIT is one of the evidence-based treatments for child trauma. So it's really hard to overstate. I have to say, out of the three uh, psychotherapies that we've talked about today, if I could only teach a clinician one, it would be PMT because it includes a lot of those other strategies that we have for CBT for anxiety and depression and mobilizes the parents in a way that's going to be so necessary to really optimize those other two. So hopefully some of this will, you know, be food for thought and thinking about what are some things that we could deploy in primary care or in outpatient mental health. I could go on and on, as I already said, but I hope that, you know, kind of talking about strengthening the parenting strategies and also kind of strengthening the parent child attachment is one of the most critical things we can do for child behavioral health.